So this morning we are going to be continuing on with our series of Hall of Faith. And if you're just joining us this Sunday, uh, uh, so far in the month of June, we've been looking at Hebrews chapter 11. And this is a, a list of men and women of faith, heroes of faith, people, um, the ordinary men and women of God who did extraordinary things because of their faith. And so we're going to be going uh, each week, we're going to be looking at each person that's listed there in Hebrews chapter 11 and seeing what we can take from them and, and learning why the author of Hebrews included them on this list of heroes of faith. And so, so far we learned about Abel, right? He was the first person that we met. And from Abel, we learned how to give in faith. And last week, we learned about Enoch. And Enoch, if you remember, lived to be 365 years old. And what stood out about him was that he was alive during the darkest days of humanity, right? We, if we remember that, that after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, and all the way up to the time of Enoch, so this is about almost a thousand years, humanity just became progressively evil. Sin continued to, to, to wreak havoc around the world, right? Sin had corrupted every single part of, of every human that was alive here on earth. And we remember, right, that it was so bad. Humanity, it was so evil. There was, it, sin was so rampant in, in, in the world during this time. It was so bad that this was called humanity's darkest day. And throughout that span of about 1,500 years, we learned that only two people, two people, right, out of millions, only two people are spoken of positively. Only two people are spoken of, of being righteous by God during this time, and that's Abel and Enoch. And now we're going to meet the third person this morning. So you imagine that, right? From humanity, from a stretch of 1,500, 1,600 years of millions of people, only three people are called righteous by God during this time. And so today we're going to meet our third person of the Hall of Faith, and it's Noah. And so remember, right, that evil and corruption was so bad that God regretted making humanity. It was so bad that God regretted making or creating humanity. And so he wanted to just wipe out humanity, right? He just wanted to get rid of not only humanity, but every living thing on earth. That's how bad the world had gotten. And so with this in mind, right, let's, let's go ahead and read um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. And we're going to read a little bit about Noah the third person on the Hall of Faith. Verse 7 says, It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. And so this morning we're going to meet Noah, and I think that Noah's no stranger to us, right? I, I think we're all pretty much familiar with the story of Noah and, and, and the ark and the, the flood that covered the entire world, right? It's one of our first, it's probably one of the first Bible stories that we learned if we grew up in Sunday school. Um, you know, we used to have a picture of the ark or paint it on the side of the, the nursery, right, with the animals sticking out, or maybe it's on the side of your, your dentist or your doctor's office or something, right? We, we're all very familiar with the, the, the story of Noah and the ark. And sometimes I feel, um, especially when it comes to the Old Testament, it, it, it gets easy for us to think of um, all of these um, stories in the Old Testament as just stories, right? It's just kind of like fables or something just fun learning growing up, right? When, you know, who, who doesn't want to learn about animals going into a giant boat, right? But we have to remember that these events actually took place. These events actually took place. All of everything in the Bible, right? We learned last month. Everything in the Bible was placed there and serves a purpose by God to to teach us something for us to to learn from. And so, if you really dive deep into um, the story of Noah and the, and the Great Flood, there is so many things that we could take away from. There's so many um, uh, you know, representations of Jesus there in that story, and just so many things that you can pick from there. And the, the flood, right? The flood during Noah's time serves as a major point in not only humanity, but also in the Bible. And we learned that, you know, this was a turning point for humanity, but this was also a major turning point in God's plan for redemption uh, after the fall. And so there's so much that we can learn, there's so much that we can take from the flood, and, 
you know, maybe we could do a, another series on that or have a Bible study focused on specifically the flood. But this morning we're going to focus so, um, specifically on Noah's faith. Right? We're learning about the Hall of Faith. We're learning about what was it about the, these men and women in Hebrews that stood out to, 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 the, to the author that we can learn from. And so let's jump back, right? Let's go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. And we're going to get a bigger, a better picture of what was going on during this time, right? And as I said, many of us are familiar with the, uh, the story of Noah, and so this will serve as a refresher, or maybe some of us haven't read it, right? So let's go back to Genesis chapter 6, and this is going to be quite a few verses, so hang in there with me as we go through it, but it's important for us to understand the story of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 through 22. So we remember the first um, verses of chapter 6, uh, God is, um, was talking about how he, you know, he regretted creating humanity and how evil was so rampant in the world. And then it picks up here in verse 8. But Noah found favor with the Lord. But Noah found favor with the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father, uh, father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jacob. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes. I will wipe them all out along the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Verse 15. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three docks, decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Verse 17, look, I am about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. And finally, verse 22. So Noah did exactly as God had commanded him. Amen. So verse 8, once again, it, it reiterates that Noah had found favor with the Lord. He was the only person, right? The only person on earth during this time that was righteous. And it also mentions here that he walked with God. And this was the same, uh, walking with God was also used with Enoch, and it was also used with, with Adam and Eve. That's how close of a relationship you know, we learned that last week. That's, it, that means like having a really close relationship, being in constant communion with God. So Noah was righteous, the only one, and he walked with God. And then we see here on the rest of the verses that we read that God goes on to give Noah his instructions on how to construct the ark. And so he, he lays out very detailed plans about how big, how to construct it. And then we finally get Noah's response, right? Verse 22 Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. And so what, what about Noah can we learn? What, why was Noah included in the Hall of Faith? I have three points this morning that we're going to go through. Three things that we can take away from the story of Noah and how we can apply it to our lives. The first point that I have this morning is that he had faith in the unseen. He had faith the unseen. So going back to Genesis chapter 6, from verses 11 through 22, God lays out his plans to Noah, right? He tells him, okay, well, the earth is going to 
you know, it's so corrupt, it's so evil, I'm going to cast judgment on it, so we're going to flood it, everyone's, you know, everything's going to be wiped out, every little thing on earth is going to be wiped out. And then God commands Noah to build an ark, and he gives them specific dimensions and instructions what to build it from, how big it was going to be, even what side the door was going to be on, and, and all of that, right? And so if you look at it, if you're roughly the size, if you're, you're trying to get a, a picture of how big the ark was, it was, it was a pretty massive, um, you know, vessel to build. You know, if we put it in, in terms of what we can understand, the ark itself was probably as long as a football field and a half. Right? So that is, that's pretty long, right? And it, it says that uh, if you do the, the, uh, the measurements for how tall, this is almost a four-story tall building. And so imagine that, a, a, a vessel or a boat that is as, as long as a football field and a half and as tall as a four-story building. And that is what God told Noah to build. And then after that, God says, enter the ark with your family and bring two pairs of every kind of animal. Animals that fly, and animals that walk or scurry on the ground, and then on top of that, make sure you have enough food for them and for your family. Now let's, let, let, let's put ourselves in, in Noah's shoes for a minute, right? Or, or sandals, I don't know if he had shoes. Maybe he had sandals. Put ourselves in Noah's sandals, right? What would be going on in your mind? You know, you're walking with God, you're living your life, and then God all of a sudden, hey, by the way, I'm going to flood the earth, everyone's just going to die, I need you to build this four-story, almost equivalent to a four-story building, and you know, it has to be exactly like this. Oh, and then on top of that, you're going to have to make sure that every single kind of animal is on here, make sure you have enough food, and your family's on there. And you know, so imagine what was going through Noah's mind at that time, right? Uh, just think, like, how impossible or how crazy do you think all of that sounded to Noah? If, you, if we were there, that like, God told you all of these things. You know, like, the world, the world's going to flood? The entire world's going to flood? I have to build this massive structure in the middle of nowhere? I'm not even near any, like, you know, ocean. I'm not near any, any, any large body of water. You want me to just build an ark right here in this middle of this, this field? Think about that, like I said, how massive this structure was. Think about all of the, the number of materials he needed, right? How many trips to Home Depot he would have to make to build this thing or trees to cut down. How much labor and time was needed to do, to, to build all of this. And then, like I said, on top of that, he was nowhere near any major body of water. It was just like if, if you just looked out like the back of our church and God told us to build an ark right here, right? We'd be like, okay, <laughs> like why, right? I, I, I don't know why. So he had to build all of that. And on top of that, he had to play zookeeper or crocodile hunter and get every single animal of, of every kind on the ark and make sure they don't eat each other and make sure that they're all fed and all of that stuff. And then on top of that, you would have to, con- you would have to convince your wife and then your sons and their wives to believe everything that God has told you and to get them to join you on the ark. Now, how crazy does all of this sound? Right? If we're just, just being honest, it's pretty crazy, right? You know, how many of the people that, you know, Noah's friends or family, how many of them would have laughed at Noah? And he's like, hey, yeah, God told me I have to build an ark over here. How many times did somebody laugh at his face? How many times did somebody scoff at him or, you know, like, you're crazy, right, for, for, for thinking all of this stuff, right? Or you're crazy for doing all, for building an ark. And even if we just look at the very first part that, that God told Noah, that the entire world was going to flood. Like, I looked this up, right, because, you know, everyone's talking about global warming and, you know, the, the glaciers and everything's going to melt. So I was like, is that enough? You know, if all the, every, every single glacier, every single ice, all ice on Earth were to melt, would it be enough to cover the entire Earth? And no, it wouldn't. It would, you know, flood like the shorelines, but it wouldn't cover the entire Earth. So, statistically speaking, flooding the Earth was impossible. So if you were Noah and God say, I'm going to flood the whole earth, you're like, you know, your human mind will be like, that's not possible. It's statistically, that's, you, you, that can't happen, right? But God was asking Noah to have faith in him and his plan. To have faith even when it sounded impossible. And let's put this into perspective, right? 
all of these things that God told Noah was going to happen did not happen for another 100 to 120 years. Now imagine that. Most of us here, we're not like, you know, we learned last week, right, that they, they lived longer back then. Over 120 years before everything that God told them would happen actually happened. That's a lifetime of waiting. And so what God told Noah would happen was unforeseen. It wasn't, you couldn't see it yet, right? It was unexpected. And sometimes God, you know, he, he, he tells us things, right? He reveals his plan to us. And God will, like Noah, God expects us to put our faith in the unseen. You know, God might speak to us. He might reveal his plan for our future or what he wants you and I to do. And sometimes, you know, God will tell us something and you might laugh at first like, <laughs> me, God, you want me, to, you want me to be a missionary and go to, you know, this country? Me, God, you want me to share at Bible study? Me, God, you want me to pray at youth night? <laughs> you shouldn't be afraid to pray, right? But like a lot of these things, God will tell us things that sound crazy. They sound impossible. They sound unfeasible, right? We might do the calculations in our head. I think that statistically that can't happen. Or, you know, whatever God is calling us to do, we can't imagine ourselves doing it. But it is our job, right? We see here throughout this dialogue with Noah in, in Genesis chapter 6, Noah didn't ask questions. Noah didn't run away. There's no mention of Noah like, wait, wait, hold on, God, are you, no, you're right? There's no, no mention of Noah stopping God in his tracks and saying, wait, are you, you sure you're talking about me, God? Are you sure you want me to do this? Nothing, right? You see, like Noah, our job, when God tells us to do something, when God reveals his plan, our job is not to ask questions. Our job is not to calculate the, the probabilities of something being done. But our job and what God expects for us is to put our whole faith in Him. God wants us to put our faith in Him, and He will do and take care of the rest. Amen? Now, has anyone here, has God ever spoken to you? or revealed something to you about your future, what you were going to do, and you kind of like laughed at first, or maybe you got scared, right? I, I think that all of us here had some, some point in our life when God told us something, and we, we were either scared or nervous or laughed at Him. Back in 2017, I, I took a trip to the Philippines to uh, attend the, uh, the national or the international convention up in, in the Union, and some of us from our church went and, you know, I, we, we attended. I was able to be one of the speakers there. And then the MC president of the Philippines approached me at the end of the convention. He's like, oh, brother, um, we're so blessed. Uh, we would like to make you the, you know, the keynote speaker at our MC camp at the end of the year. And, you know, I'm standing there like, it's April. That's already like four or five months away, right? Like I, I used all my vacation time to come here. I don't have any money. I think at that time I was still doing like part time. So I was like, I don't have any money. And then their camp is like the week after Christmas, and I was like, I'm not gonna miss you know Christmas here with my family. And you know Christmas time, if you know, that's the most expensive time to travel anywhere, let alone the Philippines, right? And so, like they they asked me, and I was like, okay, well I'll, I'll think about it. And I remember just thinking in my head like, <laughs> like what? God, you want me to come back here? Right? It sounded crazy. I didn't know. How I was going to get back, how I was going to get the money, I didn't know, like, anything. I just thought, you know, like, okay, that was funny, God, you know, ha, you know, and all that stuff. But long story short, you know, it was an, I, I ended up going, God made a way. I said yes, and God took care of everything else, and it was an amazing time. I was able to preach, you know, in front of, like, almost a thousand youth, and I was so scared. It was, like, outside and thousands of youth, and I was like, I, I don't even speak to God or anything. I just have to do this in English. But, you know, I, I thank God for that because I said yes and I was able to, to, to experience that and they were able to be a blessing to myself. But that's what it sounds like sometimes, right? That's how we can think when God tells us something about what he wants us to do or reveals our plan. And so if we remember back to um, two weeks ago, we learned what faith is. And, con and faith is pretty much this, right? Confidence in the things unseen. Confidence in things that we cannot see. And so if we remember, we go back to Noah. Noah couldn't see God's plan come to fruition yet, right? This was all 100, 120 years away 
Noah couldn't see all of that at that time. But as we know, Noah chose to have faith. He chose to have confidence in the unseen and trusted God's plan. He had to believe what God was saying to him was true. And he had to believe, although he could not see what was going to come. And so when God calls us to do something, or when God reveals his plans for our future, don't focus on the improbabilities. Don't focus on the impossibility. But be like Noah and put our faith in God who can do the improbable and who can do the impossible. Amen? The faith in the unseen. The second thing that we can learn from Noah this morning is obedient faith. Obedient faith. And so after God spends the, you know, eight verses giving Noah the instructions uh, of what to do with, uh, or how to construct the ark, we get Noah's response in verse 22. And so like I said, remember, putting ourselves in, in Noah's sandals, God told them all of that. Everything that he wanted him to do, everything that he was supposed to, to build and, 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 and all of that. And here we get Noah's response in verse 22. And it says, let's go back and read it. It says, so Noah did everything. Everything exactly as God had commanded. Amen? Short and sweet. We, we don't, we, there's no mention of Noah asking God questions, right? There's, we don't see Noah over there. God, where am I supposed to get all this wood from? God, how am I supposed to get a lion inside the, the ark without, you know, eating me alive, right? We don't get any questions from Noah. We don't hear anything about Noah doubting God. We don't read anything about Noah complaining. We don't read anything about Noah rebelling against God. We don't read anything about Noah running away. Given this, this big, this monumental task that was before him, Noah did everything God asked him to, exactly as it was instructed. And so when we are presented with the option or, or, or when he was presented with the option of putting his faith in God, Noah did not hesitate. And as I said, imagine how much work he had to put in to build that ark. All the time, all of the blood, the sweat, the tears, every detail that he had to pay attention to, being made fun of by his neighbors and his friends. Think of all of that, right? And, and people making fun of him, calling him crazy for doing all that. All of that that was before him, he chose to be obedient. Noah proved that from his faith, or that from faith rather, obedience follows. We learned two weeks ago that faith consists of two parts. The first part of faith is believing. Amen? Believing something. But the second part of faith is relying or on that belief. Or putting our faith into action. Amen? I use the example of, of flying. And then, you know, like there's, like all, there's like all these news stories came out yesterday about like two almost near misses and all that stuff. But flying is still safe, right? <laughs> I just took a flight this week. But flying is safe, right? This is the example I use. Flying is safe. There, you have a 1 in 11 million chance of having something going wrong while you're on a plane, right? That's less than 0.2%. So the statistics, right? We can rely on that fact that, okay, flying is the safest form of transportation. That's the belief. But as I mentioned, you still need to get on the plane. You still need to rely on that fact. And so going back to faith, faith requires action. And in the case of Noah, he didn't just believe what God said. He relied on him. He put his faith into action. See, believing is one thing, but putting our, our faith into action is another. And we have to understand this, right? Faith. If we claim to have faith, if we want to prove whether or not the faith that we have is genuine, genuine faith is always marked by obedience. If we want to know if the faith that we have is, is real, then we have to ask ourselves, are we obeying what God is telling us to do? Am I relying on God and, 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 and His promises. Because if there is no action, the Bible says that our faith is dead or our faith is useless. So genuine faith is always marked by obedience. And this is one of the parts that make 
Noah stand out as a hero of faith. He chose to be obedient and put his faith into action. Even if it took him 120 years, right? That's, like I said, that's a long time. After one year, maybe some of us here would have wanted to give up or would have been discouraged. But for 120 years, he continued to be faithful to God and faithfully built the ark throughout that time and did everything that God did, even when he couldn't see the end result. And so when God calls us to have faith, don't just believe in him, but rely on him. Put our faith to work and have obedient faith like Noah. And I'm already on my last point, so I wasn't going to speak long. <laughs> the last point I have this morning is that faith is possible. Faith is possible. Now, the last part of Noah's story that, that stands out and that makes him a hero of faith is similar to what made Enoch stand out, right? And we remember the, the, the circumstances that we spoke about earlier and what we learned last week. That Enoch lived through the darkest times of humanity. And that is the same reality that Noah faced. He lived in the, in the darkest times of humanity. And so imagine Noah. And putting ourselves in, in Noah's life, right? Imagine all of the evil, all of the immorality, all of the corruption that filled the earth. All of that. And as we read, Noah was the only righteous man. Think about that, right? Right now we have about 7 billion people on earth. Could you imagine if out of all of that 7 billion, there was only just one person who was called righteous by God. Imagine that, right? And so, Noah was the only righteous man on earth. And as we remember, we're... We know that we're made righteous not by our works, but by our faith. And so like Enoch, imagine how difficult this would have been. Imagine how difficult it would have been to remain faithful to God and, and to remain righteous when there's so much evil that was prevalent in the world, when there was so much pressure to conform, when there were so many temptations to sin. Imagine how lonely Noah felt living in a world of evil. In 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and seven others in his family. Noah war warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. So this verse tells us that for... During this time, while Noah was building the ark and gathering all of the animals, for over a hundred years, he was trying to warn others. He was trying to get others to repent. He was telling all of his friends, his neighbors, hey, God is going to flood the world. You need to repent. You need to come back to him. But over a hundred years of, of, of warning others and preaching to them about repenting, not a single person repented of their sin. And so through humanity's darkest days, only Noah and his family found favor in God. Now, while one person, right, like I said, one person in the whole world, while only one person out of millions of people is not a good statistic, it proved one thing. It proved that faith is possible. Even if it was just one person, no matter how dark the world was, no matter how bad the, or evil the circumstances are, or how difficult it was to live in that world and to trust in God, it could be done. And in verse 7, it says that by his faith, he condemned the rest of the world. And so what does this mean? We're going back to 2 Peter. It tells us that he preached righteousness. So, so Noah didn't go around preaching condemnation to the world. He was preaching righteousness, trying to get them to repent. But this is what this, this, this part of verse 7 means. It means that it was his faith, it was Noah's faith that made the rest of the world's unbelief more apparent. Noah's faith stood as, an, as evidence or it proved the unbelief of the rest of the world. His righteousness revealed the unrighteousness of the rest of humanity. So therefore, it was their unrighteousness. It was the rest of the world's unrighteousness or unbelief 
that condemn them to be lost in the flood. And as we learned last week, the Bible tells us that in the end times, the, our world that we live in will be just like the days of Noah. And we can see that, right? All you got to do is turn on the TV or go on social media to see how prevalent sin is now in the world. How, moral, uh, how, how immorality has crept in into our culture. Things that weren't accepted, you know, years ago are accepted now. And so the world that we live in is only going to get worse. It will be exactly how it was like Noah's days or even worse. But Noah tells us, but Noah, his example tells us that if, if he could believe during the darkest times of humanity, if he could choose to trust in God, then so can we. We can remain faithful. We can hold faith is possible even in the darkest days of humanity. By his faith, he showed that it was possible to believe and trust in God, no matter how foolish or how difficult it would have seemed. And Noah proved that even when we can't see the outcome, even when it's difficult, when we're ridiculed, when we're persecuted, even when it seems impossible, and even in the darkest days of humanity, we can have Faith is possible. Amen.